Good morning, Carson Bible Church. I would like you to take your Bibles and open to Zechariah chapter 11. Um, I know recently we've been taking shorter passages and we have been working through one point sermons. Today we are working through all of chapter 11, uh, which is uh, verses 1 through 17. Not a terribly long passage, but it is the entire chapter. It all is essentially one uh, sermon for Zechariah and for his people. And so we are going to take it um, all together uh, this morning as well. So if you turn to Zechariah chapter 11, I'm going to pray and then we will get started. Heavenly Father God, uh, we before you, a holy God, confess that we are sinful and that we are corrupt. We are creatures living in a fallen creation uh, because of our own selfishness, because of our own sin. And God, we confess not just uh, a sinful condition in general, but we confess our specific sins, our sins of commission and our sins of omission, the things that we've done and the things that we've not done that we should have. God, we look to you because we know that we can never make ourselves right. We can never make ourselves holy. We can never merit your favor. God, we are uh, terribly lost without you and without the one true Savior, Jesus, your Son. We are terribly lost without the Holy Spirit. And so we ask your blessing on our time in your word. We thank you for salvation in Jesus alone. We thank you for the wisdom and guidance of your Holy Spirit. We just ask that you would be glorified by our time in the Word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we get started in our text, I would like to share with you a, an epic poem written by the great philosopher and theologian Theodore Geisel. Now the star-bellied sneeches had bellies with stars. The plain-bellied sneeches had none upon theirs. Those stars weren't so big, they were really so small, you might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. But because they had stars, all the star-bellied sneeches would brag, we're the best kind of sneech on the beaches. With their snoots in the air, they would sniff and they'd snort, we'll have nothing to do with the plain belly sort. And whenever they met some, when they were out walking, they'd hike right on past them without even talking. When the star belly children went out to play ball, could a plain belly get in the game? Not at all. You could only play if your bellies had stars and the plain belly children had none upon bars. When the star belly sneeches had Frankfurt or roasts or picnics or parties or marshmallow toasts, they never invited the plain belly sneeches. They left them out cold in the dark of the beaches. They kept them away, never let them come near, and that's how they treated them year after year. Then one day, it seems, while the plain belly sneeches were moping and doping alone on the beaches, just sitting there wishing their bellies had stars, a stranger zipped up in the strangest of cars. My friends, he announced, and a voice clear and keen, my name is Sylvester McMonkey McBean. And I've heard of your troubles, I've heard you're unhappy, but I can fix that, I'm the fix it up chappy. I've come here to help you, I have what you need, and my prices are low, and I work at great speed, and my work is 100% guaranteed. Then quickly, Sylvester McMonkey McBean put together a very peculiar machine. And he said, you want stars like a star belly sneech? My friends, you can have them for $3 each. Just pay me your money and hop right aboard. So they clambered inside. Then the big machine roared and it clonked and it bonked and it jerked and it burked and it bopped them about, but the thing really worked. When the plain bellied sneeches popped out, they had stars. They actually did, they had stars upon theirs. Then they yelled at the ones who had stars from the start. We are exactly like you, you can't tell us apart. And we're all just the same now, you snooty old smarties, and now we can go to your Frankfurter parties. Good grief, groaned the ones who had stars at the first. We're still the best sneeches, and they are the worst. But now, how in the world will we know, they all frowned, if which kind of which and the other way around? 
Then up came McBean with a very sly wink, and he said, Things are not quite as bad as you think, so you don't know who's who. That's perfectly true, but come with me, friends. Do you know what I'll do? I'll make you, again, the best sneeches on beaches, and all it will cost you is ten dollars eaches. Belly stars are no longer in style, said McBean. What you need is a trip through my star off machine. This wondrous contraption will take off your stars, so you won't look like the sneeches who have them on Lars. And the handy machine worked very precisely, removed all the stars from their tummies quite nicely. Then, with the snoots in the air, they paraded about, and they opened their beaks and let out a shout. We know who is who. Now there isn't a doubt. The best kind of sneeches are sneeches without. Then, of course, those with stars got all frightfully mad. To be wearing a star now was frightfully bad. Then, of course, old Sylvester McMonkey McBean invited them into his star off machine. Then, of course, from then on, as you probably guessed, things really got into a horrible mess. All the rest of the day, on those wild screaming beaches, the fix it up chappy kept fixing up sneeches. Off again, on again, in again, out again. Through the machines, they raced round and about again, changing their stars every minute or two. They kept paying money, they kept running through, until neither the plane nor the star bellies knew whether this one was that one, or that one was this one, or which one was what one, or what one was who. Then, when every last cent of their money was spent, the fix-it-up chappy packed up and he went. And he laughed as he drove in his car up the beach. They will never learn. No, you can't teach a sneech. But McBean was quite wrong. I'm quite happy to say the sneeches got really quite smart on that day. The day they decided that sneeches are sneeches and no kind of sneech is the best on the beaches. That day, all the sneeches forgot about stars and whether they had one or not upon theirs. The end. Uh, well, of course, you probably know Theodore Geisel better by his pen name, Dr. Seuss. And you know that sneeches aren't real. In fact, it's not about sneeches at all. It's about humans in our insecurities, in our fragile egos. And it's about leaders who come in and profit from our insecurities and our fragile egos. And it turns out that the Bible, God's Word, has quite a bit to say about leaders who profit at the cost and to the detriment of those people they have been charged to lead and care for. And the Bible has quite a bit to say about people who follow leaders who are wicked and selfish and unjust, though they know exactly what they are from the beginning. That's what Zechariah chapter 11 is all about here. So let's get into our text as we leave Dr. Seuss behind and get into God's word. Zechariah 11, starting in verse 1. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen, for the glorious trees are ruined. Wail, oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has been felled. The sound of the wail of the shepherds, for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions, for the thicket of the Jordan is ruined. Thus said the Lord my God, become shepherd of the flock, doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them slaughter them and go unpunished. And those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, I have become rich. And their own shepherds have no pity on them. For I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord. Behold, I will cause each of them to fall into the hand of his neighbor and each into the hand of his king. And they shall crush the land and I will deliver none from their hand. So I became shepherd of the flock, doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders, and I took two staffs. One I named Favor, the other I named Union, and I tended the sheep. In one month I destroyed the three shepherds, but I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. So I said, I will not be your shepherd. What is to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed, and let those who are left devour the flesh of one another. 
and I took my staff favor, and I broke it, annulling the covenant that I had made with all the peoples. So it was annulled on that day, and the sheep traders who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out my wages as 30 pieces of silver. And they said, the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and I threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Then I broke my second staff union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Then the Lord said to me, take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I'm raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed or seek the young or heal the maimed or nourish the healthy, but devours the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hooves. Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye, let his arm be wholly withered and his right eye utterly blinded. So if you're confused and you're a little bit lost, don't worry, we're gonna work through this. What we have here in chapter 11 is the closing of um, the final two messages, the first of the final two messages that Zechariah is preaching. Uh, what we've been working through in chapters uh, 9 and 10, really, is uh, these prophetic messages that Zechariah was preaching. And uh, remember that this last section of the entire book of Zechariah is really comprised of these two sermons. And the first one is ending here in chapter 11. The next one will begin in chapter 12. So we've been working through these prophetic messages. And we've been working through this imagery of the humble, Davidic, messianic shepherd king that was to come to Israel. And he would be unlike any other king that the world had ever seen. He would be humble and compassionate, and yet at the same time, he would be powerfully victorious in battle. He would gather his sheep, and at the same time, he would transform his sheep into war horses, and they would be triumphant on the battlefield. And really, what we're seeing here in chapter 11 is the truth that that shepherd king would come and would actually be rejected by his own people that he came to save. Zechariah here is doing something that a lot of the other great prophets did, which is to live out this sort of living sermon illustration. Um, God asked Ezekiel to do a number of these things. God had Ezekiel uh, laying out on the ground in the middle of the city for everyone to see and these very odd food that he was to eat and very odd way to prepare it. And it's all lived out as this um, living sermon illustration. God had the prophet Hosea marry a woman who was a prostitute and bring her out of prostitution and then we see that she goes back and Hosea goes and retrieves her again and she goes back. And that's this living sermon illustration. God had Jeremiah in prison and then go out to buy a field and live out these various sermon illustrations. Ezekiel, actually his, his wife essentially dies as, as what is really a, a sermon illustration. Um, and Zechariah here is doing the same thing. He's gonna go through this very troubling experience in order to live out a sermon illustration for his people. I think it's just uh, a powerful reminder that to really live a life in a wicked world 
that portrays God to really live out the truth of the gospel to a fallen and wicked people means that it will cost. There are very real consequences to living that out, often humiliating consequences. It costs to truly live out God's message to his people. But here we go. Chapter 11 is bookended by these poems. It begins with sort of an out-of-place poem, and it ends with an odd poem as well. So verses 1 through 3 here. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cypress, for the cedar has fallen, for the glorious trees are ruined. Wail, oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has been felled. The sound of the wail of the shepherds, for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions, for the thicket of the Jordan is ruined. And some of those places might sound familiar to you. Um, this region of the Jordan, uh, this region of Lebanon, and it should sound familiar to you. This poem is a transition from the previous text into what this text is talking about now. Remember that Lebanon and this northern part of the Jordan was just talked about in terms of God's restoration, these furthest reaches of the boundaries of the promised land that God would restore his people and they would inhabit even the furthest region, regions of the land promised to Abraham. And there would be flourishing, there would be abundance, there would be prosperity. And now all of a sudden, God is pronouncing judgment and destruction on these same places. And Lebanon is really significant for its cedars. We see that a number of times in scripture. Lebanon is significant for uh, its groves of cedar trees. And cedar trees were considered to be the most majestic, um, the, the most steadfast, the strongest type of tree. What we see here in this poem is that the cedars of Lebanon are being destroyed. And the pronouncement is on the lesser trees in nearby regions. So to the cypress trees, right? The cypress trees are to wail and to mourn because the cedars have fallen. And if the cedars have fallen, that means that the cypress trees will fall as well. And as the cypress trees fall, the oaks of Bashan are called to wail because that forest has fallen as well. So it starts with the cedars and then goes on to the cypress trees and then on to the oaks of Bashan. And then we hear the shepherds wailing. And we remember from previous texts that the shepherds were the image of the leaders of Israel. And it seems that God is pronouncing his judgment on the wicked leaders of Israel. And uh, what's interesting is that even in the terms of restoration, in the terms of triumph, um, of being valiant and courageous in battle, of being transformed and victorious. It's always in terms of God's people being in great danger, and it was always in terms of warfare, right? And so one of the things that we should have been asking all along is what's going on with all this warfare and what's going on with this great danger that God's people are in um, as he is also at the same time talking about restoration and um, prosperity. <laughs> well, what's happening here is likely the foretelling of the destruction of Jerusalem and the second temple by Rome which happens in 70 AD uh, because certainly the Roman army comes in just like wildfire and absolutely lays waste to Jerusalem 
and destroys this second temple that Zechariah, Haggai, Zerubbabel worked so hard to encourage the people to rebuild. And yet because of disobedience, um, when God sends the messianic shepherd king, his people reject him. And not 40 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, the Roman army comes and lays waste to Jerusalem and destroys the temple. And in fact, um, we have some historical documents that actually refer to the second temple as Lebanon. Um, and it's because so much cedar from these cedar stands in Lebanon were used to, in the construction of the second temple. And so even the term Lebanon there may, might be a reference to the second temple. And so this transition to the judgment on Israel's wicked leaders, the destruction, the coming destruction of Jerusalem in the second temple brings us to this sort of living sermon that Zechariah is going to act out. He's going to play the part of the coming messianic shepherd king. And we're going to see what happens. Verse 4, thus says the Lord my God, become a shepherd of the flock doomed to slaughter. Well, a flock doomed to slaughter would have likely been Sheep that were kept for the specific purpose to be used in temple sacrifices. Um, remember that as the people returned to the promised land, um, the, the, a lot of the land outlying Jerusalem was desolate. It was not good for uh, pasturing flocks. It wasn't good for agriculture. And of course, it was also filled with people who were hostile towards the Jews. They didn't want them there. And so um, as people um, are no longer uh, raising their own sheep, raising their own livestock, they're living more within Jerusalem, they need to depend on being able to purchase a lamb, uh, purchase a sheep that was approved by the priest to be used for sacrifice. And so the temple system then would have employed shepherds whose sole purpose was to raise sheep so that they could be sold to be used as sacrifice in the temple. And so these sheep would have been considered doomed to slaughter anyway. Verse 5, those who buy them slaughter them and go unpunished, and those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, I have become rich, and their own shepherds have no pity on them, for I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord. Now imagine this. It's giving us some insight to the potential abuses and corruption of the temple system. People need to continue to make sacrifices to atone for their sin. And if they are not raising their own livestock or if they live far away from Jerusalem and it's not reasonable really for them to bring their livestock to the temple, they have to be able to purchase animals to make their sacrifices. And of course we see this in the New Testament, we see that happening. So con consider what it would mean to be a shepherd who is taking care of these flocks that are being raised solely to be sold for sacrifices. Um, these shepherds and these sheep traders could have potentially gotten wealthy selling animals to be used for sacrifice. And imagine that. Their wealth and their fortune is gained because of the sinfulness of the people. 
right? The people aren't going to stop sinning. They will continue to have to purchase sheep over and over and over and over again. And here are shepherds who are shepherds and sheep traders who are growing wealthy. And God has never intended anyone to grow wealthy and to profit at great gain because of the sinfulness of people. And so God likens these shepherds to the leaders of Israel who are profiting and gaining at the cost of the people they were charged to care for. And God here says, I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord. Behold, I will cause each of them to fall into the hand of his neighbor and each into the hand of his king, and they shall crush the land, and I will deliver none from their hand. Um, This reminds us of Romans 1, where God just gives people over to their wickedness, to their corruption, to their idolatry, and allows them to fall victim to their own sin. So here in verse 7, Zechariah obeys God. He says, So I became the shepherd of the flock doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders, and I took two staffs, one I named Favor, and the other I named Union, and I tended the sheep. Uh, Of course, um, we know that shepherds would have had uh, two instruments, two tools, two staffs, uh, one used to Um, inspect and care for the sheep and guide them and the other used to either punish the sheep if they uh, wander too far repeatedly and also to fight off predators who would attack and consume the sheep. Here Zechariah has a staff that he has named Favor and a staff that he has named Union. Some of your uh, Bibles might say, instead of favor, they might use the name beauty or goodwill. Some of your Bibles, instead of the name union, might use the name bands or bonds even. But here's where it's going, is that Ezekiel has already lived out a sign act like this. If you read Ezekiel chapter 37, God has Ezekiel get a stick and write the name of the house of Joseph, representing Israel. And he takes another stick and he has Ezekiel write the name Judah, representative of northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And what God has Ezekiel do is bind those two two sticks together into one, representing the unity a reunited kingdom of the house of Joseph, Israel, and house of Judah, northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And we saw that in our previous chapter, right? We saw the prophesied union, reunited kingdom. Let's see how it goes. And I tended the sheep. Here Zechariah is living out being a good shepherd. Verse 8, In one month I destroyed the three shepherds, but I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. Uh, We don't really know what three shepherds it is that Zechariah is talking about. We don't have any other real biblical reference to this. We don't have any historical, extra-biblical reference to any, um, what we would imagine to be leaders of Israel that... Zechariah apparently drove out or removed from their positions. We just don't know. One idea is that as Zechariah is acting out what it means to be the good shepherd, um, we know of three offices that the true good shepherd, Jesus, the Messiah, fulfilled and then has eliminated the need for, right? The offices of prophet, priest, and king. 
And so there is some speculation that that might be what the reference is here, is that these three leadership positions, prophet, priest, and king, are going to be eliminated by the good shepherd. And that may be so, but again, we just don't really know exactly what that reference is to. But here's what happens. I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. The sheep themselves reject Zechariah as a good shepherd. They don't want to be led and cared for by a good shepherd. Verse 9, so I said, I will not be your shepherd. What is to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And let those who are left to devour the flesh of another. Of course, sheep aren't carnivorous. Sheep don't eat each other. But uh, such is the detest that they have for Zechariah as the good shepherd. And such is the Im how impatient Zechariah has become with them. That as God previously had pronounced, he's just going to let them be slaughtered. He will walk away from them because they have rejected him. And he will allow them to be destroyed and they're so wicked that they will even destroy themselves. They will destroy one another. And here's what Zechariah does in these two sign acts with these stabs. I took my staff favor and I broke it, annulling the covenant that I had made with all the people. So it was annulled on that day and the sheep traders who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. The staff that represented God's favor to his people, the staff that represented God's role of protecting his chosen people from the surrounding Gentile nations, God breaks that. And God will no longer protect his people. He will no longer keep the Gentile nations at bay. And again, that's what we see in the destruction of the trees and the destruction of these forests. And um, Jerusalem eventually will fall to Rome. And then I said, verse 12, If it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. So this is another sign act. Zechariah goes to the people who have hired him to work as a shepherd. And he has played the role of being a good shepherd. He was rejected by the flock. And so he breaks the image of God's favor with his people, and he deserts the flock, he leaves them, and he goes to those shepherds who had hired him, and he collects his wages. And his wages that they say that he was worth is 30 pieces of silver. And what's interesting is that uh, we see some sarcasm here. We see Zechariah say, the lordly price at which they priced me. That's sarcasm. 30 pieces of silver is not a lot of money. And we see that Zechariah is kind of disgusted with that. They valued him so low, he's disgusted with it. And, and God tells him to go and take those wages and throw them to the potter. And Zechariah goes and he throws them into the temple. Um, it's a little bit unclear what that's all about because in some ways we, we would expect there to be a potter in the temple because of the constant need for vessels and uh, the use of uh, these pottery vessels in the temple. Um, so it may just be that Zechariah used them 
as a donation to the potter, but we, we do see his disgust because they're, he's told to throw them to the house of the Lord. There's some speculation that the word potter actually is a scribal error or, or a misspelling and that the word actually in uh, the original language would have been uh, for a, a silversmith or uh, that the temple would have had a, a foundry for actually using silver and making silver vessels. That's a possibility. Um, it may be that it was a scribal error or a misspelling that it actually means the treasury and it was just simply meant that Zechariah is disgusted with how he has been uh, undervalued and he throws these pieces of silver into the treasury in his disgust. We don't actually know the, the entire context, but we do know this is that in some way, Zechariah's actions are prophetic in that the good shepherd, Jesus, will be sold out for 30 pieces of silver by Judas, will be betrayed, and that ultimately Judas ends up throwing those 30 pieces of silver back into the temple in the house of the Lord. We go on here to another sign act. Verse 14, Then I broke my second staff, union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And true enough, as historically we see Rome come and destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple, so again, the tribes of Israel are no longer reunited, but scattered again to the nations as much as God, through Ezekiel, prophesied the bringing of his people out of exile and restoring them and reuniting them as one nation, so again, because of their disobedience, because of their rejection of the true Messiah sent to them, the Good Shepherd, God will remove his protection from them, he will remove his favor from them, and he will undo the unity of them as one nation. And Rome will come and destroy their city and their temple and scatter the people to the nations once again. Verse 15. God calls Zechariah to live out yet another sermon illustration and actually, this is a little more troubling. The Lord said to me, take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. Foolish here doesn't mean silly, doesn't mean not smart, it doesn't mean uneducated, it means wicked. It means evil, it means ungodly, it means worthless. It's foolish in the sense of how Job called his wife foolish when her suggestion to him was to just curse God and die. First, God called Zechariah to live out this role of the good shepherd and to see how the flock of his people would reject the good shepherd. And now, God calls Zechariah to live out the image of a wicked shepherd. Verse 16, For behold, I am raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed, or seek the young, or heal the maimed, or nourish the healthy, but devours the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hoofs. Zechariah then goes and portrays this evil shepherd. And the wicked shepherd doesn't care anything about the well-being of the sheep. In fact, he's destructive to the very sheep that he is supposedly in leadership to care for. 
And the sheep don't seem to mind it at all. We see this, this weird terminology used here. He devours the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hooves. Think about being a shepherd. And think about what the wisest use of sheep might be. Certainly they're more valuable for their wool, right? They can be sheared and they grow wool again and they, their wool can be sold and as they grow back their wool they can be sheared again. Certainly sheep are more valuable for what they produce in wool than for meat. For a shepherd to actively be slaughtering the sheep to consume them for their flesh is very short-sighted. It means that this wicked shepherd is focused on short-sighted, immediate gain at the cost of the life of the sheep. And when it talks about tearing off even their hooves, humans generally are not so brutal when they consume an animal, right? This is predatory behavior. This is uh, an animalistic, non-human type of destruction and consumption of the sheep. And then we end with this poem. Verse 17, Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm in his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered, his right eye utterly blinded. See, this wicked shepherd is a pretty familiar image to Bible readers. Daniel would call him the little horn. Zechariah here calls him the foolish, wicked shepherd. The Apostle Paul will call him the man of lawlessness. And the Apostle John will call him the beast. We might call him the Antichrist. A wicked leader who will deceive many who will be utterly destructive, harmful to God's people. And yet what we see here in this closing poem is that the Lord still has divine authority and sovereignty over even the most wicked leader who would be the greatest destroyer of God's people. He will strike his arm and his right eye. That God ultimately will strip that evil leader of his power, his influence, and his authority. Here's, I think, what is the most important application that this scripture teaches us? Because this teaches us a lot about human nature. You ready? Humans will reject good leaders even when God himself gives them to us. God's people had numerous promises of the messianic shepherd king, humble and compassionate, that God would, himself would send to them. And God's people, Israel, and humanity at large has rejected him as their king. We have a tendency Number one, in leadership, <clears throat> to abuse power. 
and those under leadership have a tendency to follow those who abuse power. We have a tendency to follow wicked leaders. How many times do we have to see pastor after pastor after pastor fall, worship leader after worship leader after worship leader fall? It's because we have valued talents and gifts over character and morality. We make the same mistake with young people coming up in the church. How many times do we see talented and gifted young people come up in the church and they show so much promise and they fall? It's because we as church leaders are also guilty of encouraging young people to sharpen their talents and gifts rather than sharpening their character. We've done so to their detriment and to our own detriment as well. This is relevant for all people in all times, and I think it's particularly relevant for us right now. We're just six weeks out from a presidential election, aren't we? You know what names will be on that ballot. And you look at those names, and you think to yourself about their character. And you think to yourself about their morality. And you ask yourself, this is the best our nation has been able to come up with. What do we as a people and a culture and a society, what do we value? And when will we start valuing character and morality? See, the good shepherd did indeed come to his people and he was rejected by them. We're told in the New Testament that he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. But he didn't mistreat them. Rather, he was subjected to mistreatment by them. He didn't sacrifice them. Rather, he allowed himself to be sacrificed at their hand. He didn't sell them for profit. Rather, he allowed himself to be sold out by them for short-sighted gain. Now, what does it look like for you and I to follow a rejected shepherd. J.C. Ryle reminds us of the cost of being a true Christian. It will cost you your self-righteousness. It will cost you your sins. It will cost you your love of ease. It will cost you the favor of the world. I think more importantly, The rejected messianic shepherd himself reminds us in John chapter 15, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. If the world has hated and rejected the messianic shepherd king sent by God himself, why would we ever expect the world 
to be friendly to us, to show us favor? Why would we ever expect our values to line up with the values of the world? Why would we expect anything other than the world to take great joy in profiting and gaining at our expense? The Sneetches figured it out. When will we? That only comes by the new covenant in Christ, where those ancient prophets promised that our hearts of stone could be replaced by a heart of flesh. That's the message that we proclaim and preach. We follow the rejected messianic shepherd king. And we expect nothing less than to be rejected ourselves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we know that the world rejects you. God, strengthen our resolve by your Holy Spirit to continue to follow you even in this corrupt world, though it may mean our rejection, though it may mean our loss. God, our loss in the name of Christ is gain. We look forward to an inheritance that you have set aside for us that can never perish, spoil, or fade. We look for your eternal kingdom where Christ is king, where you are worshipped endlessly, God. And we rejoice to know that our citizenship in that kingdom is secure. We pray that in the name of our King Jesus. Amen.